over many years to try and figure these things out, these secret things about nuclear weapons and their impacts on people and the environment that are so important. Um, I also feel that it's important to be at the UN today. The Ban Treaty is under discussion. Um, if I can paraphrase the, the words of uh, our amb US Ambassador uh, Haley, um, uh, uh, she's, uh, the United States is rejecting the Ban Treaty because we need nuclear weapons to keep us safe. Uh, I think that's the essence of her talking point. Um, and this position neglects the terrible risk of escalation, use of nuclear weapons, and the risk that the whole system may catastrophically fail, that the system has weaknesses, that there's the risk of accidental use of nuclear weapons, risk of miscommunication between the US or Russia or other nuclear powers. Um, it, the only way to get to reduce that risk is through, is through global nuclear disarmament. Um, and uh, the ban treaty is terribly important, uh, I think. And for, also for the process, for negotiating what that treaty would look like, what it would cover, how would it be verified. These are really important questions that haven't been addressed like this before. So it's super big progress to my mind. Um, uh, a word about my background, I work for NRDC, it's an environmental organization. Um, uh, uh, a lot of my colleagues work on climate change or endangered species or preserving wilderness. Uh, where does nuclear weapons fit in? Um, uh, every country that has made nuclear weapons has hurt its own people and harmed, its, harmed the environment. And there's a very strong connection there. Another connection with the environment is that the budget that Mary Lea talked about for the Department of Energy, it's moving over $2 billion from clean energy, from renewable energy, from ARP, the RPE program, from energy efficiency to nuclear weapons. That's the Department of Energy budget is a microcosm of uh, Trump's larger budget, uh, which has been called a, a hard power budget, where the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, uh, those budgets are increasing, but everything else, education, uh, uh, all the civil society programs are being reduced. So. Um, so uh, that's, a brief, that's my brief introduction to our work. Uh, we'll be talking about the U.S. nuclear modernization program, and, uh, and uh, I'll turn it over to Hans for uh, the next part of our introduction. Thanks, Matthew. Um, I'd like to stand up when I do slides. It's more, more fun. Um, so then, yeah, there we go. So like Matthew said, we were started off on a project uh, a long time ago, <laughs> trying to track um, sort of hidden and hidden advances or improvements to nuclear weapons programs during the life extension programs. Because like you heard before, during the Cold War, we used to do things in a different way. We were built, you know, routinely, entirely new weapons. Uh, if we needed a new weapon for a new mission or a new weapon system, we would build a new warhead for it. Uh, not so anymore since the end of the Cold War. And instead now they modify, uh, initially s slightly, um, <laughs> the, the warheads. But, as Marilia talked about, uh, in the near future, they're going to modify these warheads much more than they've done in the past. So I want to start with this. Next slide. Um, just by giving you a little... Uh, some of this is missing from the yeah. bottom. Uh, uh, well, nice. Perfect. We should lower the lights. Uh, I think we've figured out how. So if we can that, without that darkness, way. that would be great. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see how much we can we can see. If it gets too hard, then we can turn it down too. Is it read? It's readable, though, right? Yeah. We'll see. That'll be our mistake. Well, you don't make it later. That's right. Better. That's good. Oh, see. All right. So the way we're going to break it up is that I'm going to talk a little about uh, two of the programs that deal with this. I'm going to focus on, on the, uh, uh, the, 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 the weapon system we were talking about in the latest article in the Bulletin on Atomic Scientists. But then I'm going to talk about, and then Matthew's going to take over and he's going to talk about uh, you know, how it works, you know, this, um, this uh, technology that they're uh, apparently making use of. Um, and then. We will end with some uh, remarks about the implications for strategic stability and strategy and these types of things. Um, 
And of course, the reason that we want to work on this and, and make it in this context, also with the, with the band talk, is that modernization, both in terms of the endless perpetuation of the nuclear era through modernization programs, as well as increasing military capabilities to make weapons more usable, go to the heart of what's wrong with the current status. Um, we can't have another 40 years of promises of, you know, just you know, have faith. We're going to work on it. And somewhere down the line, we're going to try to get rid of these nukes. Um, right now, it seems to just be, um, you know, a lot of work under the hood here and under under the delay of, of the ultimate promise. Um, and I want to emphasize that we're just talking here about the U.S. Stuff like this goes on in all the nuclear arms states. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a worldwide problem. Everybody is modernizing. Everybody is extending the nuclear era. Uh, everybody is busy doing this. They're spending enormous amounts of money not just extending their existing capabilities, but improving their capabilities. Everybody's doing it. So the non-nuclear world has a lot of work to do um, to, to drive this home. Uh, next one. So I'm starting not from the, not the warhead, but I'm actually going to start from this guy, uh, the B61, which is also about increasing capabilities. If you hear officials talk about this, of course, that's not the case. We're just essentially giving it a new layer of paint, uh, dusting it off, and off it goes. Um, and with this, as with so many other um, examples uh, or statements, there's more under the hood than, than you would imagine. Um, what's mostly important about this particular weapon system is that it's not just another uh, B-61 bomb. It is an enhanced one that gets a guided tail kit. That means it can steer towards its target and hit more accurate. That is a new military capability <laughs> for a gravity bomb. There are no guided nuclear bombs in the U.S. arsenal. Now, this is a new capability. Um, there are many details. You can go into that later. This is information overkill, but we wanted to make sure that you have uh, the information available. Next. In, in this particular, we've seen some interesting examples of how it improves capability. This is from a, a test of the bomb, a drop test in 2015, in which um, they released this video of, uh, of this, uh, this, this drop from an F-15, and it hit somewhere in the, uh, in the desert. Um, and what we could see here on the picture was, was only this available, uh, the one we could see on the, on the public website or in the video. Um, so we couldn't quite see the size of this ring um, and so it was hard to uh, assess the, you know, accuracy of this hit. Um, but we sort of, we flipped it over and, and, and saw and checked if this uh, ring was, was adequate and, or, or, or accurate. And it looks like it hits well within 30 meters. And uh, that is a significant advantage of these gravity bombs, actually. And so we were beginning to think about, you know, what is going on here? Why would they want to en enhance the accuracy of the weapon? And, and if you take the next slide, and, and so what's happening is that they have a lot of different gravity bombs right now. They want to just have one that can do all the missions. But the one they want to keep doesn't have a, as powerful a warhead as the most powerful in the stockpile today. So how do you overcome that gap? Well, you do that by increasing the accuracy. By putting the lower yield warhead and I'm not talking mini nukes here, but I'm talking lower maximum yield, closer to the target, this less powerful warhead or weapon is capable of doing what today requires really powerful weapons. Um, now, why would they do that? We have the weapons that can do it, so why do you need to go through this? And there are several reasons for, depending who you're asking. Um, one of the important ones is an, an overall interest in the modernization program to increase the accuracy of nuclear weapons so that the warfighters can give the president strike options that involve less radioactive fallout. A cleaner strike. There's nothing that's a clean nuclear strike, but a cleaner strike. And the point here is you don't get radioactive fallout you know, over the neighboring country or not as much. 
you may not get as much fallout over the general area where your troops might have to operate uh, so forth. It would be it would always be politically very difficult for a president to order the use of nuclear weapons. And I'm not suggesting here that I think that we're going to see U.S. presidents suddenly popping nukes everywhere. But it can change the kind of advice that he gets from his military advisors about what to do in a certain situation. And if they have to go to him and say, Mr. President, all, uh, we can't find any other options to knock out this facility, but we have this, um, you know, one megaton bomb. And he's going to like, yeah, right, it's going to look really good. But if they can come to him and say, hmm, we, could, we could choose this one, it has an option of five kiloton, it can do the same job. This, is, this is, will change the way that military advice flows to the president in a crisis. Next. Um, Switching quickly to the next one, so I'm, that was the B-61, we can go back to that later. Even before Obama came in as president, way before, even before W. Bush came in, during the Clinton years, they started a program <laughs> um, that was about life extending the most numerous warhead in the U.S. stockpile, which is the W-76, one of the two warheads on the Navy's ballistic missiles. And they needed to extend this warhead so it can continue to function for another 30 years. And uh, that meant upgrading many different components of it. Whenever there was a debate about what to do um, and how much could you do, the promise was always the life-extended warheads will not have increased military capabilities compared to the weapons they replaced. And in this case, they kept saying, the reason is we're using the same warhead. We're not changing the warhead. It's the same explosive yield. We're not increasing the yield of the weapon, so everything is good. And most of the focus was on the warhead, the nuclear explosive package itself. Very few people paid any attention to other components that are not in the nuclear explosive package itself, but are in the reentry body that hides the nuclear explosive package and protects it when it goes toward its target. And these are the tips of those um, cone-shaped nuclear warheads, um, the very top of them, that contain what's called the arming, uh, fusing, and firing unit. It has uh, the radar, the uh, accelerometer, the altimeter. It, it has everything that senses where the weapon is. And it essentially, from this unit, comes the signal to the nuclear explosive package. You're at the right spot detonating. Next. So it's important that when you talk about modernizations, you have a nuclear submarine, massively expensive weapon system. Ballistic missiles, what are they? 50 to 60 million dollars a piece. Warheads placed in the top of them, and it's the tip of this warhead that is being enhanced. So you have the same submarine, the same platform, the same ballistic missile, the same warhead, but just by changing components in the fusing system, can you increase the military capability of the weapon? And for the we we we, we saw in indications of this for years. We, I first wrote about this back in 2006 or something like that, and uh, but we couldn't figure out how they did it. The first, the old warhead had three pre-settings. It could either detonate on contact with the ground, or it had a pre-set height of burst, or a very high altitude burst setting, depending on what the mission. What they did with this fuse is that they changed it so now the warhead can detonate at any point. It's a much more flexible uh, detonation series of detonation options. So when the old warhead would come flying in you would see, with a ground burst setting, you would see all these warheads, you know, hypothetically going off at these different points, depending on that uh, inaccuracy or depending on where they went. But so you got a lot of waste, so to speak. By changing this view, and Matthew will come, come into the detail later, the warheads will go up at, at an appropriate height of burst instead of waiting till it passes the target. 
So statistically, a far greater number of the warheads would detonate into this, inside this lethal volume, so to speak, where it needs to go off the distorted target. Uh, Matthew will talk about the enhanced capabilities that gives. Um, next. Um, this is a program that goes way back. The United States, um, with this upgrade, will get hard target capability to all of its ballistic warheads at sea. It used to be only a small portion of them, the most powerful W88 warhead. Now it will be the entire force. We have for years had the W88, and with this introduction, uh, the, uh, the, the number of weapons uh, that can be used against to destroy, for example, hearts, heart and silos um, goes up uh, significantly. Um, and here the black line, you can see how many of them are actually deployed. This program is so no, now so far ahead that all the warheads that are on the submarines right now carry this view. It's out there, it's operational. Um, and as you can see, it started way back. It was like 90... 6, 95, 96 or so, it began. So, you know, it's been rolling through all these administrations. Uh, and it's going to finish in 2019. And, um, yeah, next. Matthew will take over now and, and talk much more about the science behind this uh, and, and the physics. Okay, um, thanks, Hans. So, this is the before diagram. So, this is showing um, the 10 lines that are coming in are are 10 different nuclear attacks, um, 10 uh, missile warheads flying in to attack a, um, a uh, Russian missile silo. Um, so the, uh, uh, there we go. Okay, so, um, so this uh, uh, part of the picture right here is the target, the military target, the missile silo. These things are what's called hardened. They have, they're underground, they have cement protective structures. They're meant to withstand a, uh, even a, a nuclear explosion, perhaps. And so there's a in, in the in the lore of nuclear targeting called circular error probable. It's basically a, a, a radius, um, a distance from the center of the target, in which you'd expect about half of your warheads to fall, and half would fall outside that radius. Um, it's a function of the accuracy of your system. So this is the old W76, and so if each of those 10 lines is one attack, you can see those those yellow, um, uh, those yellow um, uh, 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 detonations at the bottom, um, five of them are outside uh, the, uh, the radius at which the silo will be destroyed, and five are inside, and that's really the best the best that that military system can do. Um, so next slide, please. This is the uh, improved W76. So now, the difference is that um, your warhead uh, uh, can uh, sense uh, what very precisely what its altitude is coming into the target. And then the, um, the software in the warhead can calculate how much am I missing that target and so choose to detonate earlier um, rather than, than later on the ground, detonate earlier based on that calculation of its trajectory. And so it can be inside this, uh, this um, uh, what's called the lethal volume here. So now, whereas we had five warheads detonating outside the radius that could kill that silo, now all of them are in here um, destroying the military target. And uh, it's described as one of the first uses of artificial intelligence in a few systems. So what that means is that the system itself is taking a measurement of its environment. It's measuring its altitude precisely. And then from that, calculating, well, how uh, much am I going to miss this target? And, 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 you know, should I detonate early so I can still get it from above? So that's the essence of the, uh, the upgrade. As I mentioned, this is a lot of detective work. Ted Postel found patents for this uh, going back to the 1950s, worked out some of the physics. Hans had read about this program historically, had you know, come across tidbits of what, what this is, and then so our work together put this, our, our work put this together, the, the, um, the clues from report, government reports and, and then, the, and then the, the patent and then understanding the physics. Next slide, please. 
Um, yeah, so this is how we did the, uh, the research. So um, there's, these are classified secret systems. So there are a lot of things we don't know, but we can um, figure out what a reasonable range is for the things that we don't know, and then we can simulate over and over again uh, what, the, what the warhead coming in to the target, um, uh, what it would do uh, with this new system. And so at the bottom is actually uh, our, simulate, our computer simulation of, um, the, um, uh, of the old versus the new system. And each point uh, down there corresponds to uh, a, a one run, a one computer run of the simulation. So through this study, we, we were able to, I believe, really understand what this system is and, and, and what it means. Next slide, please. Um, so what it means is that uh, 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 by a simple, cha uh, a straightforward change to the fuse that took decades, multiple presidential administrations, that was done without underground explosive testing, without that signal that you're changing the technology in a big way, um, you've increased the ability to destroy uh, uh, Russian missile silos by a lot, uh, and uh, uh, by factor of three, about. Um, why is this a big deal? Um, well, nuclear weapons have missions associated with them. A nuclear, uh, if you're in charge of the nuclear arsenal, um, uh, you have a number of weapons that equals a certain amount of deterrence to your adversaries, but the weapons also have missions, and these can be um, uh, discrete, Scenarios, something's very wrong in North Korea, only a nuclear weapon can uh, address this threat, the military commander says, or um, really big threats, the Russian nuclear arsenal being the biggest one. Nuclear weapons have basically two um, categories of, 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 of nuclear pl war planning, and these fall into uh, what's called a counter force, where you're attacking the enemy's nuclear weapons, or a counter value which is the code for attacking the enemy's cities. Counter, the essence of deterrence is holding what your enemy values at risk. Nevertheless, these different nuclear missions really define in the Cold War what the US arsenal was and, and even today. Counter force, holding the, the enemy's nuclear weapons at risk, requires the most nuclear weapons and is the most difficult to execute and is really what drives the size of U.S. and Russian nuclear arsenals. Not China's nuclear arsenal so far, but that, that, may, that may change. Next slide, please. Um, and so, so this is a, a similar slide that shows the almost certain ability of the W-76, the submarine-launched warhead, to destroy um, a target that's, um, that is reinforced, but not to the extent of, of Russia's most reinforced, most hardened silos. Next slide, please. Um, and this gives a sense of the um, size of the crater that would be produced uh, by the explosion of the, the nuclear warhead. So this is a, um, the, um, the energy from nuclear fission and nuclear fusion in the warhead is translated into, um, into blast, into, into thermal radiation, uh, into uh, uh, x-rays and neutrons, and that creates this that shock and heat and radiation creates this, this crater. Uh, next slide, please. And this gives, um, uh, for the, um, the, the uh, other warhead in the submarine arsenal, the W88, which has about a factor of uh, four and a half greater uh, explosive yield, this, this gives a sense of what that crater would look like and by scale the, the capital, the U.S. capital building. Um, so these nuclear weapons, uh, um, uh, so what we're talking about is this counterforce targeting, using nuclear weapons to threaten the nuclear arsenal uh, of Russia, to hold, hold, it at, hold it at risk. And this program is about really dramatically increasing that capability uh, in, in a way that, that seemed like a routine upgrade, you know, a maintenance, a, an upgrade, but in fact had profound implications. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one other, so, one, so what are the implications uh, for stability? And, and Hans will say more about this. But one thing we talked about in our article was the fact that um, right now Russia does not have a, a system of satellites to, uh, for early warning of a, of a nuclear attack from the United States or any other country. It relies on radars on the ground. 
which can only see o over the horizon. They can't see over the curvature of the Earth, unlike satellites. And so Russia has a very short time window in which the, pres the Russian President Putin would have to make a decision that, yes, Russia is under massive nuclear attack by the United States. We must retaliate. We have plans. Go. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a matter of uh, less than 10 minutes um, uh, with this, uh, um, so in terms of minutes to make a, a decision that would be um, uh, un unbelievable in its consequences. Next slide, please. Um, so Hans and I um, and Ted published this on the Bulletin Atomic Scientist website, and uh, it's gotten a lot of reactions. There are like 140 comments. A lot of them really, a lot of them really interesting comments on on the Bulletin's website, and it's starting to be picked up by the media. Um, we've also had uh, people from the inside reach out to us and say, you know, you got it mostly right. You know, I, I worked in the classified systems. You guys got it mostly right. Uh, there's, there's one thing that I can't talk about, but it's a little different, but your implications are, you know, your conclusions are sound. Um, uh, so we, I was, we were, but one of the reactions I was most curious about were the Russian reaction. And there are a couple of Russian experts uh, who have often in the past been spokespersons for the Russian military defense and the Russian president, one of whom is General Viktor Yasin, who I know uh, personally. General Yasin was uh, in charge of uh, Russian uh, nuclear forces, and in fact, he was in charge of them during one of the scariest incidents uh, uh, since the Cold War ended in 1995. Um, uh, there was a, uh, a launch of a scientific rocket out of Norway. Uh, it was called the Black Brant. It, many of you probably know this story, it activated Russia's early warning system. It looked like the start of a nuclear attack. And uh, General Yasin was, was in charge when that happened and had responsibility for assessing that it wasn't the start of global thermonuclear war. Pretty, pretty heavy stuff. So he read our article and uh, he said, uh, uh, we knew about this. <laughs> this is nothing new to the Russian leadership. Um, maybe that's confirmation, I don't know. Uh, but he said, uh, he says, we're modernizing too. Everything is, uh, you know, Russia will match whatever the U.S. Has, which um, you know is 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 uh, is uh, uh, not quite arms race thinking, but it's sort of in that it's 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 dual modernizations that are keeping up with each other. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another uh, uh, Russian reaction was from General uh, uh, Vladimir Dvorkin, also whom I, I know, and uh, uh, he um, his reaction was, uh, I don't believe I don't believe the implications in their study. The 100 kiloton warhead, so roughly five times Hiroshima and Nagasaki range and yield. We classify that as a light warhead in Russia. <laughs> you wouldn't use such a, 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 a light warhead to attack a, a target as important as, a, as an enemy's missile silo. I, I thought that was a typical Russian reaction. <laughs> but, um, uh, so um, I feel like um, the fact that we've got this information out there, uh, uh, that we've uh, gotten some good validation uh, on our findings and that we're getting reactions, including reactions from Russia, uh, is a, was, a, was a really, uh, was a, really uh, a good outcome uh, thus far. It was only released on March 1st, so, uh, so it's still fairly new work. Um, okay, well, well I'll, just, I'll just finish with a few remarks about, <clears throat> you know, further on the strategic stability, obviously, implication. Next slide, please. Um, yeah. Um, but also, I want to. I also want to put this in context from where the U.S. nuclear planning is at. Um, the point being that this kind of modernization happens at the same time that the U.S. was working to reduce its nuclear arsenal, and it is continuing to do so. And so, for the for the administrations, this was actually a sweetener. This was a, uh, a way forward without underpinning US national security. Because if at the same time you reduce the numbers, the ones that are left are more flexible to cover more different types of missions, then suddenly you have a different, uh, a different cost of planning. You're not significantly cutting capabilities out of the stockpile, you're just reducing the overall size of it, 
but you're ensuring that the rest of the stockpile is capable of covering all the missions. And so for them, increasing effectiveness of warheads was actually, in their mind, um, supporting the goal of reducing nuclear forces, ironically. Um, and so what's the, 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 what we're concerned about here, of course, is the dynamic that this drives in the perceptions between great nuclear powers. What, what is the other side up to? And like Matthew said, uh, in the Russian planning camp, if they only have 50 minutes or less of warning time, their planners will be more interested in a capability like this that not only is on land on an ICBM and will take half an hour to fly to Russia, but can go on a submarine right next to their coast, come in low and hit in a very short time, especially if you can hit the uh, the most important of their assets, those uh, ballistic missiles that are in the silos. So that's just something that intuitively drives worst case scenarios and suspicion about the other side's intentions. And you add to this the equally important uh, development there is in significantly increasing the capabilities of long range conventional precision strike weapons and cyber effect capabilities, and ballistic missile defense capabilities. In, a, in, a, in, a, in the planner, in the mindset of a planner, all of these elements add up to bad intentions. Um, there doesn't seem to be sort of an overall thinking about this in military planning. <laughs> you know, what is the grand strategy? What is the grand effect of all of these different capabilities stacked? in terms of how our strategic uh, relations evolve with our adversaries. And it's kind of bizarre to do these things because I just want to remind you, a few years ago we got this um, report that the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, together with the intelligence community put together. It was Congress that asked them, you know, what are the Russians up to? Tell us a long-term, uh, immediate and long-term uh, outlook for what, where Russia is going and the implication for strategic stability and all these types of things. And I want to just sort of point this one to you, um, that in this report, I can't remember which one it is. The bottom one is the DOD and DNI report to Congress. Yeah. It should have been. <laughs> anyway, I didn't want to be. The, the point of it was that they concluded in that study that there was no, there was nothing the Russians could do in terms of pulling out of the New START Treaty and vastly increasing the number of nuclear we weapons that would give them a military advantage. Okay. That was the, so confident was the assessment in the U.S. ability to you know, endure and do what they had to do if they had to do. Um, and so that, that for me is just one of those crucial pieces of reasoning when you hear arguments left and right today that, oh, our nuclear forces are not capable enough. We need new capabilities to do this and do that and you know, all these types of things. So um, there's sort of a, you know, a strategic reality, if you will, on the ground in terms of what's enough. And then there are all these crazy ideas about we need this capability, that capability, this capability. And, and ironically, and I don't know if that's uh, you know, noticed, uh, I, I actually find that quite often in public hearings for examining Congress, where you hear the pushback against crazy ideas and crazy plans, uh, strangely enough, comes from U.S. Strategic Command. People who say, yeah, 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 we've heard it before, you know, we don't need it, we have enough capabilities. The pushers of this stuff, that's from the labs, it's from the defense contractors, it's from the crazy right-wingers and, the, you know, the hawks in the, in the committees. Um, and so I think there, there is that disconnect, but I think it's important to look for that. When, when the top military commanders tell these guys, we don't need it. <laughs> There's a reason for that. But nonetheless, this W-76 upgrade, uh, and certainly also to some extent the, w, the, the B-6112, are examples of what's happening under the radar screen in terms of improving military capabilities during life extension programs. So there you go. All right. And uh, just uh, uh, one final note, um, 
uh, on this project. Um, I, I left, I ended the project with uh, 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 a kind of a, a feeling, a cynical feeling, um, <laughs> because, you know, as we work on nuclear arms control, um, at least I, I feel an idealism of nuclear arms control is about cooperative problem solving. It's about um, trust, it's about sharing information, coming to a common understanding, reducing risk together. The Obama administration had proposed to Russia to go to a thousand nuclear weapons. Uh, Russia never took the Obama administration up on that. But what our research, one of the finding implications of our research was that the Obama administration, at least the Department of Defense, felt it could go to a thousand weapons because with this new fuse, it could do the same military mission with fewer weapons. And so that's that's what's left me with a little bit of a of a cynical feeling after after doing this doing this work. Okay.